Okay, folks, this is Book Talk with Corbin. I'm your host. We have a returning guest with us, uh, Cheryl Chumley. Ma'am, did I spell that correctly? I mean, that's pronounced you know, that correctly. Yes, you did. All right, Cheryl Chumley. Uh, Chumley. I'm, I'm, I'm bad on words. I'm bad mm-hmm. on English. I only speak Kentucky English, guys. You know that. But she's a great guest. Um, she has a uh, Twitter account. It's at C-K-C-H-U-M-L-E-Y. Check it out, you know, and um, she has a great book that's come out, Lockdown, The Socialist Plan to Take Away Your Freedom. Make sure you get that as soon as possible. And I do believe you can get it at CherylChumley.com, uh, C-H-E-R-Y-L-C-H-U-M-L-E-Y.com. You guys make sure you get a copy of that. Because let me tell you guys, a lot of what she covers in, in that is very important. You know, as most of you know, I used to be on, on the left. I was a very active uh, Marxist uh, in the Marxist movement, you know, worked for the Marxist-Leninist uh, newspaper up in Manhattan, The Guardian. And, you know, when I read a lot of these books, you know, I can give you personal stories about all sorts of these guys uh, in the left. I mean, uh, Gus Hall, James Steele, Andrew Pulley. You mention it. You mention their names, and I can talk about them. So when I sort of uh, did a quick read of the book Lockdown: The Socialist Plan to Take Away Your Freedom, I said to myself, "Yeah, yeah, you guys need to read this. Definitely. Uh, this is no exaggeration. She's not some nut job on dealing with conspiracy theories or anything like that. She's hitting it dead on. And you need to, you need to, uh, you need to get that book. You need to get that book immediately, man. What I wanted to do today is just talk about some basic concepts." Um, that have uh, that oftentimes come up in discussions, at least in discussions I have with folks about the whole relationship between um, religion and liberty and and the so-called church and state uh, situation and, and things like that. So I wanted to do is just sort of throw some things out there and then just have you respond to them. One thing I wanted to put out there is is doesn't the U.S. Constitution say, you know, say that there's a separation of church and, and state? Doesn't it say that? Uh, it, it's great to be back with you, first off. Thank you for having me. And to answer your question, no, you don't find that phrase anywhere in the Constitution. That came from a letter uh, be, that Thomas Jefferson wrote to a church. And the left has taken that phrase, though, and spun it to mean that there should be a wall between religion, uh, and, and they sort of define it as faith of any mention of God and the political system in America. And founding fathers never believed that. Founding fathers had a a variety of different faiths and and levels of intensity of belief in a higher power, but they all signed on to the Declaration of Independence that called for unalienable rights that come from a creator, from someone, a, a, a god, from above. And if you take that and step back and look at how that applies to even today's political system, it's the American exceptionalism I idea of rights coming from God and government only being there to protect and secure those rights. So the idea of separating religion completely from government is in conflict with what founding fathers envisioned and what the Constitution says. So you're not arguing that that the founding fathers wanted to establish a religion or faith or anything like that. Is that right? The founding fathers ran from that, right? That's the the founding uh, years of our nation uh, was a quest for religious freedom because uh, there was a dictatorial system in place in Britain that came from the church and the king and founding fathers, well, first the colonists and then founding fathers wanted a separation of an established church from government. They did not want a, a set church to run the government. That being said, they didn't want to separate religion from uh, life, including politics, because they knew that it was only Uh, people who were constrained by belief in a higher power who could self-govern. And that goes into our concept of limited government. Okay. 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 So, so they weren't saying, Hey, Liberty, no problem. You know, God, no God, no problem. But they were, they were saying that, wait, wait a minute. Now, if you, if you want to maintain, a free society, if you want to maintain your individual liberty, 
faith is important. Is that is it? Am I getting that right? Well, absolutely. Religion, faith, it's all important. It's all tied to liberty because think about it. It's not those who are properly morally compassed who are the criminals in society. It is those without faith, those without belief that there is a day of accountability to a higher power. Those are the people that need government to set boundaries and make laws and establish rules to live by because the people who are are properly morally compassed, especially if you take your uh, laws and behavioral standards from the Judeo-Christian uh, biblical teachings, they constrain themselves. They don't need government telling them you can't do this because they already have God telling them they can't do this. Mm-hmm. I, I want to gingerly go into this a little bit, just gingerly. I, I know, you know, with the recent Rov- Supreme Court Rovis. Roe versus uh, Wade, um, and there, and a lot of response has been, or some of the response has been from the the pro-abortion side has been that, hey, you guys are trying to impose your religion on me. How how might you respond to that? Well, that's how they attack the Supreme Court justices uh, for making this constitutionally correct decision because they think that it holds the most uh, emotionally fueled argument that can bring out the uh, low information voter into the street to protest what they consider uh, a disgusting decision from the justices. But look, it wasn't religion that drove the Supreme Court justices to make this decision. It was the Constitution. And it was a decision a decision that even uh, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who was no conservative justice, even she said Roe v. Wade was bound to one day be reevaluated and sent back to the states because it was poor constitutional judicial decision making that went into uh, codifying uh, abortion as a federal right anyhow. So the justices, also, all they did was look at Roe v. Wade and they decided what should have been decided from the get go, that this is a 10th Amendment issue. This is a state's issue and it belongs in the hands of the state's legislatures and executive to decide. And, you know, I, I didn't originally intend for us to talk this much about abortion, but Okay, you you, know, you said okay. The the Supreme Court just basically said okay. Well, we're going to let the state legislatures decide this. What's the problem in that? Because, I mean, you would think, you know, if you ever listen to the pro abortion, pro choice side, that just something absolutely horrendous has been decided here. But they're they're just simply saying no. It's got to go back to the states. Let the states decide. It seems it'd be easier for me as a Kentuckian. Hey, to go deal with, oh, I go to Frankfurt. Frankfurt's an hour away from Louisville, and I go lobby my legislators. I mean, what is it they seem to hate about that or fear about that? Because of what you just described, it is a more transparent and accountable to the people way of doing business. When it's in the state's hands, it's much easier for the people in the respective states to have a voice and to have their will brought forward by the legislative body. Because if the lawmakers vote uh, in a way that the uh, citizens in that state don't like, they will just vote them out of office and bring in a batch of legislators to do their will. But the pro-abortion side wants unfettered access, at least a large segment of that side wants unfettered access, unquestioned access to abortion uh, without restriction in many cases. And in some states, like my state of Virginia, it was even argued at one point in the last few years when Democrats were in charge that abortion should even be allowed after birth, in the hours mm. after birth, which, of course, then is defies any definition of abortion and moves it over into the into the labeling of outright murder. But this is the mindset of the pro-abortion movement. They don't want to have this argued in the states because they know full well certain states won't vote in a way that allows them that free and easy access to abortion on demand. Wow. Wow. That's it's powerful. And, and to some degree, I don't want to say it's scary, but it, it's 
some degree, I, I, I'm really bothered by some of the things they come up, you know, with as far as, you know, I'm hearing there, there's some uh, movement afoot to have some of the justices removed because they claim that they lied uh, during their confirmation hearing. Have you heard of something like that? I have. That was uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez came forward, which yeah. honestly, she has no business even weighing in on this because, you know, Supreme Court justices are okayed by the Senate and she is in the House. So it has nothing to do with her, but she couldn't help weighing in anyhow. And she was saying that a couple of the justices swore to her that uh, or swore to uh, Senator Susan Collins of Maine that they weren't going to revisit the idea of Roe v. Wade. And now Alexandria Cortez has taken that on herself to say that these same justices outright lied during their confirmation hearings. And the fact is, you know full well that these justices uh, probably knew, gave nuanced answers when they were asked direct questions about Roe v. Wade, and they left ample room to maneuver because they're not going to come right out and say, I will never reconsider Roe v. Wade. They probably put it in some sort of language that gave them room mm -hmm. once they were appointed to do the action they did, and that's being conveniently left out of the coverage. Yeah, I could imagine. Uh, folks, I just wanted to let you know this is Book Talk with Corbin. I'm your host. Go to my uh, website, booktalkwithcorbin.com, and you also see my interview, my other interview with uh, Ms. Chumley here. Um, and we're going to cl conclude by saying a couple of things about your book here. Again, uh, the name of, the, uh, of your book, we can get it at your website. Is it also possible to get it there at Amazon? Oh, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Books A Million, wherever you can get books, okay. yes. Name of the book's Lockdown and the Socialist Plan to Take Away Your Freedom. Why did you write that book? I wrote it because I covered at the Washington Times for over two years the government's overreach on the coronavirus using fear to justify unconstitutional seizures of individual liberties. And I covered some of the behind scenes discussions that the left used to justify those seizures. But more importantly, I look in the book, I look ahead at what's coming down the pike because the left has no intention of letting the coronavirus go to waste. They're going to continue to try and seize individual liberties well into the future. Wow, okay. Ma'am, thank you very much. Uh, you know, I hope your book sales do extremely well, and I, I hope people will please check out your website and start following you on, on Twitter. Uh, I want to thank you so much for your service to our country, and I hope we're uh, able to do this again sometime soon. Love to. Thank you so much. Good.